Hello, it's time for the Spring 2018 Final for MA-265. Unlike all other recent MA-265 Finals, this one only has 20 questions instead of 25, which is the standard. I have no idea why. It's not like the questions that they've left are uh, noticeably harder. So, uh, I, don't, I don't really know. It's still a 120-minute exam, too. Yeah, no clue what's up with that. Question one, for a real three by three matrix A with a determinant of five, what is the determinant of this thing right here? So let's apply uh, some transformations to A to get to B while keeping track of what, uh, what we've done to our determinant. So we see uh, first off that three columns, or you can also think of it as three rows, have been multiplied by two. So we can rewrite this as 2a, 2d, 2g, uh, you get the picture. In fact, I'll just write a, d, g, b, e, h, c, f, i times 2. We know that multiplying a determinant uh, by 2 will, sorry, multiplying a matrix by 2 will multiply its determinant by 2 raised to uh, the power of however many uh, rows or columns it has. So in this case, three. So our uh, our uh, original determinant will be multiplied by two to the third power. So five times eight, which is uh, forty. Great. So what what should we do now? Uh, well, we see that uh, we have A D G in the correct position, but we have switched these two columns. If we uh, switch this C column to here and that B column to there, we should have uh, exactly exactly our correct answer. And we know that switching two columns will multiply our determinant by negative one. So when we do this switch, we will end up with uh, negative 40. So E for number one. Let A be an N by N singular real matrix. Which of the following statements are always true? So a uh, a matrix is singular if and only if its determinant is zero, uh, singular being a, a synonym for uh, not having A inverse. So A is true, its determinant must be zero because remember taking our inverse, we take uh, one over the determinant times blah, blah, blah. Um, and, and if that's zero, then obviously we're not going to, sorry, if our determinant is zero, we're going to have some issues computing that. Two, A is row equivalent to the identity matrix. Well, uh, no, this is not true. All invertible matrices are row equivalent to the identity matrix. By definition, a singular matrix is row equivalent to uh, is row equivalent to some matrix that is not full rank. Uh, so, you know, it, in the in the two by two world, we might only have one pivot position, uh, but the minute that you have pivot positions equal to your dimension, you must have an inverse. So uh, two is untrue. What about three? Ax equals zero must have non-trivial solutions. Well, what were we just saying? Uh, we were talking about how the rank of the matrix must be less than or equal to uh, its dimension. So therefore, rank is less than the number of columns. So if we use our equation for the uh, rank nullity theorem, rank plus nullity is equal to columns. Uh, so because, because this r is necessarily less than uh, the number of columns, n must be greater than zero. So our null space must be uh, not zero dimensional and therefore, and therefore uh, the solutions for ax equals zero, that whole set, which is our null space, must have solutions other than uh, the zero vector. What about four? Ax equals b has a unique solution for every b in Rn. Well, uh, no, that's the same. Uh, sorry, that's that's true. Sorry, <laughs> uh, talking's a little hard. This is false for pretty much exactly the same reason that uh, three was true. Because we have non-trivial solutions for ax equals zero, if we set uh, b equal to the zero vector, we know for sure that there are 
infinite, uh, an infinite, at least an infinite line of vectors that have all been uh, compressed onto the origin uh, as we, after we do our transformation. And thus, there is at least always uh, one place, that origin, where uh, we don't have a unique solution. There, should, there will be uh, infinitely many solutions instead. So 1 and 3, B is our answer for 2. 3, this is a little bit of a tricky one. We're given A here, and we're told that it is the sum of a symmetric and a, and a skew symmetric matrix. So let's think about what this means. So a symmetric matrix uh, is equal to its own transpose. So if we reflect it along its main diagonal, uh, it will, or, or if we look at everything on this side and look at everything on this side, they should be exactly the same. So we're dealing with a three by three case. So let's say A1, uh, A1, A2, A3. No, this is actually a terrible way of numbering it. A, B, C. And then this position will have to be B and this one will have to be C because when we take our transpose, uh, we need this, this first column to become uh, exactly equal to our first row. And then D, E, this one must be E, and we'll have an F here. So you can take the transpose of this and see that it is uh, equal to the original matrix we started with. Now let's grab a skew symmetric uh, matrix. I'll call that, ooh, going to make it really confusing here, uh, capital A, capital B, capital C, and then instead of B here, because uh, a skew symmetric matrices transpose is equal to uh, negative itself before the transpose. So we'll have negative B here, negative C, D, F, negative E, and E. So what we can do is use the fact that this is equal to negative 6, negative 2, negative, negative not negative 9, negative 8, uh, 6, 0, 6, 6, 0, negative 4, and 2, negative 2, negative 6, and we should uh, be able to solve for these values. So we'll see that little a plus big A is equal to negative 6. Uh, that's great. Um, additionally, uh, additionally, big B plus little b is equal to negative 2, but also we get a second equation for this, which is uh, negative big B plus b uh, little b is equal to 6. So we see that the difference between here, uh, the only thing that we've changed on the left-hand side is we've subtracted 2b, and by, uh, when we subtract 2b, we've added 8 to this side. So as a result, we can solve for big B as uh, big B being equal to negative four. And so, as a result, we can use that to solve for little b. Uh, little b must be, little b must be equal to uh, two. And uh, a little, little annoyingly, uh, we're actually done. Uh, we're done with this. We know that B is our correct answer, and you can go compute the rest of everything. Uh, you should get, you know, a nice little system of equations for all the capitals and their and their lowercase counterparts. But we're trying to find uh, the the skew symmetric matrix here. We've found uh, we've found four here, and since we know that negative B will be four in the skew symmetric matrix that we've we're solving for, then B is our solution for three. Four. Here's A. Let's find the 2, 1 entry of A inverse. So for our inverse, we'll need the determinant of this matrix, which will be 0 times the determinant of this submatrix, uh, minus 0 times the determinant of this submatrix, plus 2 times the determinant of that submatrix. So that will give us 2 times 1, 0, 1, 1, this determinant or uh, negative two. So we can write any entry, any entry of our inverse as one over that determinant uh, multiplied by the cofactor 
at, okay, so we're looking for the 2, 1 entry. So what we'll need to do is find the 1, 2 uh, co factor. Okay, so we're finding, we're finding the cofactor at the 1, 2 position that is the cofactor. For this position, we know that all of these cofactors will come with a sign that's dependent on this kind of plus minus plus alternation uh, scheme where every, every plus is uh, directly adjacent to, uh, you know, up, down, to the right, and below uh, a, a, a negative, and it's uh, diagonal to positives. Uh, that's a, a stupid way of explaining it. You can see what is happening right there. And so the 1, 2 cofactor will have a negative sign on it, and it will be the determinant of the matrix found by crossing out the first row in the second column. So that gives us the determinant of 1, 1, 0, 1, which is just 1. So we get uh, 1 half in the end. So 4 is A. Question 5. For a real matrix A with a reduced row echelon form there, uh, let V be the null space of A and W be the orthogonal complement of V, which is that null space. What is the dimension of W? So this requires you to know a weird, uh, weird little fact, which is that the null space is always orthogonal to the row space. Thus, W is really, W is row A. And we can find row A, we can find row A by uh, finding, finding the uh, column space of A transpose. So let's transpose A, we get 1, 0, 3, 0, 0, 1, 2, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and let's, let's simplify this down. We can use this 1, 0, 0 to turn this 3 into a 0, and then uh, what else can we do? We can, we can turn this into a 1 and subtract it uh, there. So we see that this row space has uh, two leading coefficients, and so and so uh, we can say that it is two-dimensional. It should span two different dimensions of uh, the four that we have available. So two should be our answer for five, which is C. Eight, here is A. Which of the following is a basis for the null space of A? That pretty much just means take A and reduce it. So negative one, one, negative one, zero, three, negative one, seven, zero. Let's simplify uh, this down so we can solve for uh, AX equals zero. Let's add row one to row two like that. Let's add row 2 to row 3. That gives us 0, 9. So we can simplify this to 1, 3 and then use row 1 to set it to 0, 0. And we're good. Here's our reduced uh, echelon form. So we see that uh, our free variables are x3 and x4. And so we can write a vector of x3, uh, we see that if we if we set this equal to zero, oops, that's too many zeros. Zero, zero, zero. We can uh, rewrite some equations. We see that x1 is equal to negative three, x3, and x2 is equal to negative two, x3. Also, x3 is equal to one, x3, and x4 is equal to zero, x3. Uh, and additionally. It's good to note that uh, x4 is not dependent on any of our uh, non-free variables, but it is dependent on one of itself. So this vector for x3 will turn into negative 3, negative 2, 1, 0, and our x4 vector will be 0, 0, 0, 1. And that leads us to a as our answer for 6. Let's compute the determinant of a where it's this whole this whole big thing. Yuck. So this is actually not as bad as you would expect uh, because you can kind of think about this 
geometrically. So whatever transformation is represented uh, by this matrix here that, that we're doing the inverse of, and then we are uh, uh, doing the, the non-inverse of on either sides of this, no matter what transformation that is, uh, doing, doing some transformation and then doing its inverse is the same as uh, undoing that first transformation. So the determinant of this is completely independent, no sorry, the determinant of A is complete, completely independent of these two uh, transformations here. This is just a, uh, a weird kind of a change of basis kind of thing that they're, they're trying to do. So we can just find the determinant of this middle matrix and we will be and we will be good. So because 2 is in, in a row by itself, we can factor a 2 out, noting that that position in the, in the cofactor expansion will have a plus, minus, plus, minus, plus term, uh, not term, but sign on it. So plus 2 multiplied by the matrix that we get by crossing out the row and uh, column of 2. That's 2, 5, 4, 0, negative 3, 0, 1, 0, negative 1. Additionally, we can pull out this negative 3, uh, noting that it will have a plus minus plus term. So we get negative 6 times the determinant of the matrix that we get by crossing out that row and column. So 2, 1, 4, negative 1, that's uh, positive, positive 36. So E is our answer for 7. Eight, we're told that 3a minus 2b is equal to 3 and that 2b minus c is equal to 4. Let's find the value of x determined by this linear system. So we can solve this with Kramer's rule, which tells us that x is equal to this rational expression of determinants, where on top we have, we have this matrix, but we replace our x column, so this a2, with what our linear system is equal to. So we have c6 b3, and then on the bottom we just have the determinant of uh, this normal matrix a2, b3. So solving we get 3c minus 6b over 3a minus 2b, and we, can, we should be able to use these two to solve for our answer. Uh, 3a minus 2b we're told is just 3, so we can replace that denominator and then uh, 2b minus c is equal to 4, and so we can say that, that uh, what is this? Uh, multiplying everything by negative 1, and then also by 3, we get 3c minus 6b is equal to negative 12. Okay, there we go. And negative 12 over 3 is negative 4, so 8 is a. Let's consider real polynomials of degree less than or equal to 2 together with the zero polynomial. For what value of a does the polynomial a t squared plus t plus 7 belong in the span of this set? So let's take this set, express it uh, as a vector or as a, as a, as a matrix where uh, our entries are the t squared term, uh, t, and then our constant term, like that, just, just a help you see what I'm doing here. We have uh, 2, 1, 5, then 1, negative 1, negative 3, 5, negative 2, negative 4, and then let's put this guy, this guy in here uh, and make it an, on, on an augmented system, a, 1, and 7. So at this point we can start reducing our, our matrix here. Let's subtract 3 row 2's from row 3 that gives us a 2 here, a 0 here, a 2 here, and a 4 here. So this will become 1, 0, 1, 2, like that. Let's subtract row 3 from row 2. That gives us 0, negative 3, negative 1. We can turn that into a 1, 3, 1. And then let's start working on uh, row row 1. Let's subtract two row 3's from row 1. That'll give us a 0 here, a 3 here, and an a minus 4 there. And there we go. We are ready to solve because if this system is consistent, which it must be in order for this polynomial to be in the span, one, uh, one of our second polynomial plus three of our third polynomial 
uh, must always equal the same thing over here on on the right. And so we can take uh, we can take these two terms and set them equal to each other because if these weren't equal, then if we subtracted one row from the other, we would get a uh, zero equals one or at least some uh, non-zero constant over there, which would be no good. So as a result, a minus four must be equal to one, so a must be equal to five, so nine is c. 10. This is a cool question, in my opinion. Let M33 be the real vector space of all 3 by 3 real matrices. Which of the following sets is or are subspaces of M33? So this can be really scary, uh, reading this for the first time and not, not, really knowing, not really knowing what to do, because checking for uh, subspaces of Rn feels like a much safer process than doing anything weird with... Uh, even polynomials, but uh, especially matrices. But let's just think about this. Uh, really, what we have to check for all of these is vector addition. That's the important bit. So let's take, or let's just even think about the, think about this. Um, if we take two matrices that satisfy either uh, any of these three conditions, and we add them to another matrix that satisfies those conditions, uh, does uh, do we get a matrix that still is either orthogonal, symmetric, or singular? Because if not, we will have uh, escaped, escaped that set, and thus we're not closed under vector addition. Uh, okay, what about orthogonal matrices? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go down to the 2x2 two two case just so I don't have to write as much, but uh, the, the point still stands. Let's say we have 1, 0, and 0, 1. That's an orthogonal matrix because the uh, inner product, the standard dot product of these two uh, columns is 0. Let's add that to 0, 1, 1, 0. That's another orthogonal matrix for the same reason. We get 1, 1, 1, 1, which is uh, clearly not orthogonal. So 1, because it's not closed under vector addition, cannot be a subspace of M33. Now for symmetric matrices, uh, we're actually going to come back to that. Let's go to three, the set of all three by three real singular matrices. So matrices with a determinant of zero. Uh, let's see, if we have um, one, one, zero, zero, and we add it to zero, zero, one, one, both of these individually have a determinant of zero, and I should, I need to, there we go. Now it'll work. And uh, both of these still have a determinant of zero. If we add these together, one, negative one, 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 we get uh, a determinant of negative two. So therefore, three is not, or the set of all three by three singular matrices is not a subspace of M33. Now, uh, well, we already know our answer because there's no none of the above option, but let's just think about it. I don't, I don't even need to write anything out. If a uh, matrix is symmetric, then we have you know, the same stuff up here, the same stuff done down here, and we're adding it to a matrix that has uh, different stuff up here, but it's equal to the, the stuff that's down here. And when we add those together for this position here and here, uh, we will be adding or doing the, the same operation as we're doing to its reflection around the main diagonal. So no matter what, uh, it doesn't matter what any of these values are, uh, we are all good. And you can go and check, or we can just think about what would happen with scalar multiplication. Uh, there's no scalar multiple that you can multiply the same number by to get a different number. Uh, so our matrix, our matrix, our symmetric matrices will always be closed under, under uh, vector, no, yes, vector addition, but also scalar multiplication. And since Oh, I should have also tested that since they all include the zero vector. The zero vector is singular. It has a determinant of zero. And I, and I should be saying matrix here, the zero matrix. Uh, the zero matrix is also symmetric. It, its transpose is equal to it. And uh, it's orthogonal. So there we go. Uh, D is our answer for 10. 11. Let P3 be the real vector space of polynomials of degree less than or equal to 3 together with the zero polynomial. Let W be the subspace of P3 consisting of all the polynomials such that uh, P0 is equal to P1. 
what is the dimension of W? Okay, this is this is interesting. Uh, the dimension the dimension of W. So let's think about this. Uh, what is the total what is the total number of dimensions we have to work with? So uh, P3 has a constant. Uh, so a C1, a C2 times T, a C3 times T squared, and a C4 times T cubed. Uh, all of these constants can be varied as, as much as or as little as we want in order to span, uh, span our way through P3. But since P0 is equal to P1, oh, yeah, there it is. For a second, I'd forgotten how to do this question. I was I was stalling, if you if you couldn't tell. Uh, but since p zero is equal to p one, we can uh, figure some stuff out. This is our general form, right? If we plug in zero for t, so p zero, no matter what, will be c one. And because this must be equal to p at one, which is c one plus c two plus c three plus C4, and as a result, we can set these equal to each other and subtract C1 from both sides and see that 0 must be equal to C2 plus C3 plus C4. So I kind of take this to mean that this is the, you know, the, de the defining equation that um, uh, goes by this rule up here, P0 is equal to P1, and, and thus kind of defines our, our subspace. And, uh, you know, looking at this, we have three different degrees of freedom that we can vary. And so the dimension of this subspace W should be 3. So 11 is, in fact, D. 12, find all the real numbers A such that the following vectors form a basis for R3, which is the real vector space. And I'm pretty sure this, sh this should say of all 3 by 1 real vectors. I'm not sure what you're doing with uh, an n by 1 vector. Uh, in R3. Okay, but we can solve this we can solve this problem without actually writing anything down, which is pretty cool. Let's notice that the only difference between this row and this row is the fact is the fact that um, uh, we we have A's in place of these ones. And if we were to make a matrix out of this, what would we, what we would be looking for uh, when we row reduce it, are all the values of a such that we um, such that we get fewer than three pivot positions? Because if we have fewer than three pivots, that means that one of our vectors lies on the span of the other two, and thus we uh, we do not span our three because we need three linearly independent vectors uh, at a minimum to span our three, and we need exactly three to form a basis for our three. So what if a is equal to one? Well, if a is equal to 1, we can use row 2 to set row 1 equal to 0. And we can't have uh, three pivot positions in only two rows. So a not equal to 1 is, in fact, our solution here. If a is equal to any other, uh, equal to any other value, we'll have no problem. And we can row reduce and get uh, three pivots. So 12 is a. Question number 13. Let A be a 5 by 7 real matrix such that, such that the dimensions of its column space is equal to 5. Which of the statements is true? So what that means is that we will have 5 pivots for our matrix, which means that our matrix is full rank because our matrix is 5 by 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. We don't have any more, we don't have any more uh, rows to put a pivot in, so we fit we fitted, no, that's not a word, I almost said fat. Uh, we've, we've put as many uh, pivots into our matrix as we possibly can, and so our matrix, yeah, is, is full rank, is what we would call it. So is the dimension of our null space of A equal to zero? Well, no, because we will have uh, two, three variables here that do not have a pivot position in, uh, you know, the, 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 mm, that don't have a pivot position, that's really, that's really it, and uh, and thus the dimension of the null space we can find it from we can find it uh, from our formula that nullity plus rank, which is five, is equal to our number of columns, which is seven, and as a result, uh, the nullity must be two. So that's uh, the dimension of the null space must be two. So a is false. 
What about B, the columns of A are linearly independent? Well, no, because we have two columns over here that don't have a pivot position. So they cannot be uh, linearly independent. The first five are, though. What about C, the rows of A are linearly independent? Well, we have a pivot in every row. Whoops. One, two, three, four, five. So yes, the pivots, uh, so since we have a pivot in every row, the rows of A are linearly independent. The rank of A transpose is equal to the rank of A, and uh, so the rank of A transpose is just 5. And since the row space is the column space of A transpose, and we know that the rank of A transpose is 5, the dimension of the uh, row space is also 5. So both of these are no good, and 13 is C. 14, Gram-Schmidt process time. We're finding uh, orthonormal vectors after applying the Gram-Schmidt process to this whole thing. So we can find our first vector just by normalizing the first vector in this set. Uh, that its, its length is uh, 14, so we can take 1 over, well sorry, its length is the square root of 14. So we can normalize it by dividing it by root 14, 3, 1, negative 2. Now we can find our second vector, our second basis vector, by uh, grabbing this second vector up here, 2 minus 1 minus 1, and subtracting from it its orthogonal projection onto uh, v1. So we'll subtract, we will subtract, I'll, I'll label these here, u1, u2, u3. We are subtracting u2 dot v1 over v1, v1 dot v1 multiplied by the vector v1. You'll notice up here that we are uh, multiplying by v1, or multiplying by this, this factor of v1 twice on the top and twice on the bottom, so we can actually completely ignore this 1 over root 14. It will just get canceled out in the end. So we're taking uh, u2 dot v1 on the top. That will be, that will be uh, u2, 2, negative 1, negative 1, dotted with 3, 1, negative 2, that gives us 6 uh, minus 1 plus 2, so 7 on top here. And v1 dot v1 is, is uh, 9, 10, 11, 12, well, 14. We had already found it before. So overall, we get minus 1 half times v1, where v1 is 3, 1, negative, uh, 3, 1, negative 2. Let's simplify this down. Uh, we can make this... 4 over 2, and these negative 2 over 2, and negative 2 over 2, and we are, we are, sub, in, in fact, I can do that, I can do that in, in an easier way, uh, if you bear with me for just one second. Let's, uh, let's instead multiply this entire expression uh, by 2. It, it doesn't matter really what what we do here as long as we multiply everything by the same thing because we're just normalizing the vector that we get in the end. So multiplying everything by 2 gets rid of this 1 half and we get 4, negative 2, negative 2. 4 minus 3 is 1, negative 2 minus 1 is negative 3, uh, and negative 2 plus 2 is 0. So at this point we can normalize this and see that uh, v2 is equal to 1 over root 10 times 1, negative 3, Zero. Now, looking through our answer choices, we already have our answer here, uh, but let's go compute our, and, and that's the nice thing about how they, how they like to do Gram-Schmidt process on these exams. Usually, you can only, uh, you only have to do the first step to really prove that you know what's going on. They don't, they don't make you go do the third one, but let's go, let's go do it just to make sure that we uh, know what's going on. So, V3 is going to be U3, 1, 1, 2, and then we're going to subtract out the projection of u3 onto v1. So that will be u3, uh, yeah, yeah, sorry, u3 dot v1. That's 3 plus 1 minus 4, so 0. 0 over uh, anything times any vector is just 0. So this whole component goes to 0. And then we're uh, finally subtracting out v2 dot u3. That gives us 4 uh, minus 2 minus 4, so minus 2, divided by, divided by v2 dot, oh, 
that's what I'm doing. That's what I did wrong. Okay, um, I should I should have made this more clear. Here's our v2. Uh, it wasn't clear enough for my for myself, obviously. So we're taking the dot product of u3 and v2. That gives us uh, one minus three, so negative two. Oops, still negative two, and we're dividing it by the uh, uh, dot product of v2 and v2, which is ten. So plus one fifth, plus one fifth, and instead of writing one fifth, I'll just multiply this guy by five, 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 uh, ten there, uh, multiplied by our second basis factor, so one, negative three, zero. We can see that this is six, two, ten, simplifying it down uh, to three, one, Let's see, dividing by 2, 3, 1, 5, and then we'll have to divide by uh, its magnitude to normalize it. 25, 25 plus 9 plus 1 is root 35 down there, and that is the third vector. Uh, so we're good. 14, 14 is B. Let's consider this inconsistent linear system. AX equals B with the with these A's and B's. Let's find the least square solution to this linear system. So that's the same as solving A transpose AX is equal to A transpose B. So let's compute those. A transpose is 0, 1, 1, 0, negative 1, 1. Multiplying it by 0, 1, 1, 0, negative 1, 1. That will give us a, well, 2 by 3 times 3 by 2 will give us a 2 by 2 matrix. We get... 2, 0, and it's symmetric, so we'll also get a 0 there, and uh, 2 here. This is looking like one of the uh, easier ones. So then we're uh, finding A transpose, which is 0, 1, 1, 0, negative 1, 1, and we're multiplying that by B, which is 1, 1, 0, 0. So 2 by 3 times uh, 3 by 1 gives us a 2 by 1 with... 0, 0 as our entry. So we can set up the uh, system a x is equal to this b. And since 2x1 is equal to 0 and uh, 2x2 is equal to 0, there is our least squares solution, where a, uh, a should be correct for 15, which it is. 16, let r3 be the real vector space of all m by n by 1 vectors. and uh, m22 two, two be the real vector space of all 2 by 2 real matrices. Let this linear transformation go from uh, R3 to m22 two, two, and uh, let it satisfy these things over here. So we're trying to find the linear transformation of 0, 1, 2. We will need to know what linear combination of these three uh, vectors we'll need to take to get there. And since the uh, one of the properties of linear transformations that the uh, I'm, I'm thinking of Laplace, uh, the, uh, the linear transformation of, let's see, x1 plus x2 is the same as the linear transformation of x1 plus the linear transformation of x2. Uh, we will be able to find the linear combination of these three vectors we need to get here, and then just add up that same linear combination of what uh, their transformations is equal, or what their transformations are equal to. So making a vector out of 1, 0, not a vector, a matrix out of 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, uh, we, can, we can set this equal to, in an augmented matrix, 0, 1, 2, which is the vector uh, that we want to figure out the, the linear combinations that form it, and we can solve. So subtracting row 3 from row 2, we get 0, negative 1, Subtracting row 2 from row 1, we get 0, 1, and there we go. We see that uh, 1 of these guys plus 2 of these guys minus 1 of these guys will give us uh, the linear transformation that we're looking for. So taking 1, uh, taking 1 times 2 plus 2 times 1 plus negative 1 times negative 1, that will give us uh, our first entry of our matrix, which is uh, 1, 2, 3. Oh, sorry, uh, I can't count. 
two, four, five. There we go. Addition is addition is by far the hardest part of this exam in a, in a really terrible way. Um, okay, then our second one will be three plus zero minus one. I'm just adding up these guys. So, uh, wait, did I really do that wrong again? Th yeah, okay, three plus zero minus one is two. There we go. We already know that our answer is uh, B, by the way, so that's nice. And you'll see that uh, one times that entry plus zero plus zero, it gives us that one. And then zero plus two plus zero is, uh, is two. So 16 should be B. 17, let A be an N by N matrix. Which of the following statements are always true? If A is diagonalizable, then A must have N distinct eigenvalues. Well, this is false because A can have fewer than N eigenvalues as long as uh, those eigenvalues have eigenspaces whose total dimension adds up to N. So essentially you can have uh, an eigenvalue with a multiplicity, let's say of two, um, and it has two corresponding eigenvectors that come with it. And uh, if you have yeah, yeah, yeah. So if we have if we have a three by three matrix, three by three, let's say, and we have lambda one with a multiplicity of one, and it leads to one eigenvector, and lambda two with a multiplicity of two, and it leads to two eigenvectors, then see we only have two eigenvalues, uh, yet we end up with a diagonalizable matrix because we still have three eigenvectors to work with, work with, which is which is exactly uh, how many we need. So this is false. What about two? If A is a matrix with all real entries and the eigenvalues of A must be real. Well, no, we've seen that all over the place. Uh, let's see if I can cook one up. Negative one, one, zero, zero. What are these eigenvalues? Well, we'll be computing negative lambda times negative lambda plus one is equal to zero. Lambda squared plus one is equal to zero. Lambda is equal to plus or minus i. There you go. Real matrix, complex eigenvalues, so two is false. What about three? If A is a symmetric real matrix, then it must be, a di it must be diagonalizable. So at the very end, we learned all about, um, you, you know, matrix, uh, what is it? What's it called? Orthogonal, uh, or <laughs> uh, orthogonal diagonalization. Yeah, God. And uh, the, the, cement, mm, the spectral theorem of symmetric matrices, which says that uh, all symmetric matrices are orthogonally diagonalizable. And so uh, three, yeah, that, that is true. And so 17 is B. That was, sorry, that, that question was, that explanation was a little sloppy there. 18, let A be a two by two matrix. Suppose A has some eigenvalues and eigenvectors and we're finding A to the 16th power. Well, uh, we can diagonalize A, so A is equal to the matrix P formed from smashing these two eigenvectors together, one I, one negative I, and we need to multiply that by a diagonal matrix with the corresponding eigenvalues for these eigenvectors, so I corresponds with our first eigenvector, and zero negative I, that negative I corresponds with our second uh, eigenvector. In there. And then we need the inverse of P to end things off, make the space for it at least, and that will be uh, 1 over the determinant of P, so 1 over negative 2i multiplied by 1i, 1 negative i. This will be negative 1 over uh, negative 1 over 2i, then 1i, one, 1, yeah, okay. Negative one over two i, negative, oh, sorry, that, this, this is, I, I completely forgot. Uh, we need to flip the a and d positions of our matrix P and change the signs of our b and c positions. So we get i, negative i, negative one, and one. I feel like I missed, yeah, we have a, we have a negative there as well. Okay, great. So uh, let's factor this. Factor this a little bit, we will get one half here, one half here, one over two i there, and negative one over two i there. 
in order to uh, rationalize or, or simplify these down, get the i up to the top, we have to multiply the top and the bottom by the conjugate of this i, so negative i. Multiplying by negative i on the bottom, negative i there. And so we can rewrite this as 1 half, 1 half, negative i over, uh, well, i times negative i is 1, so we just get 2, and this becomes i over 2. So I'll go put this, whoops, put this up here, and we should be good to go with this computation because a to the 16th power is just uh, the equivalent to raising that d, that diagonal matrix, to the 16th power and computing everything around it. i and negative i to the 16th will both be 1, and since the identity matrix multiplied by anything is just that uh, thing you're multiplying it by, we can get rid of it and compute this as our final step. We will get 1 here, 0, let's see, um, 0 and 1 half plus 1 half, so 1. A is our answer for 18. 19, for what value of A is the following linear system inconsistent? Hmm, interesting. Let's try to uh, solve for this. Let's set this up as a, as a system. Uh, but actually, wait, we can, we can just do this a lot faster. If we, multiply, if we multiply this first equation by negative 2, we get exactly this second equation. So negative 2A minus 2 must be equal to 2 plus 2I. And uh, if it is not, then our system is inconsistent. But we're solving for consistency, so let's find the values of A that make this true. Let's add, uh, well actually let's uh, divide everything by 2, 1, 1, there we go, and add 1 to this side, and then multiply everything by negative 1, so negative 2 minus i will make that system consistent, so 19 is c. Uh, and I'll, I'll be clear, because otherwise if a was not negative 2 minus i, then we would be able to add uh, negative one half times row two, for example, to uh, row one, and we'll get zero equals uh, something that does not equal zero over here, and which would be bad. Okay, 20, we're finding y at one, where y is the uh, lower portion of the solution to this initial value problem. Let's find, let's find our, uh, uh, our eigenvalues. We're solving 4 minus lambda times 4 minus lambda minus 4 is equal to 0. Lambda squared minus 8 lambda plus 16 minus 4, so plus 12 is equal to 0. Lambda minus 6, lambda minus 2 is equal to 0, so lambda is equal to 6 and 2. For lambda is equal to 6, a minus lambda i uh, will, will help us solve for our eigenvector. That gives us negative 2, 2, 2, negative 2, which we can simplify down to 1, negative 1, 0, 0. And since this, uh, if we set this matrix equal to 0, we can say that x1 is equal to x2. And since x2 is our free variable, x2 is equal to 1x1 and 1 of itself. So there is our first uh, eigenvector. Then for lambda is equal to 2, we will get... Uh, 2, 2, 2, 2 for a minus lambda i. We can simplify that to 1, 1, 0, 0. And since uh, doing the same thing, this means that x1 is equal to negative, negative not 2x, negative x2. We can make uh, an eigenvector. Uh, x2 is equal to negative 1x1, and uh, it's equal to 1 of itself. Okay, so there we go. Now we can, now we can go make our solution, which is x of t over y of t. I hate writing it that way, but whatever. That's equal to uh, c1 times v1 e to the lambda 1 t plus c2 times v2 e to the lambda 2 t. Now using our initial condition that uh, x and y at 0 is equal to 3 negative 3. 3 negative 3 is equal to c1 times 1 1 
plus C2 times negative 1, 1. So we can make a matrix with a C1 column, 1 C1 in both of these, negative 1 C2, sorry, and, and 1 C2 there. And then the, the, this is equal to, this is equal to 3 and negative 3. Subtracting row 1 from row 2, we get 0, 2, negative 6, so we get 1 and negative 3 here. We can add that to see that uh, C1 is actually equal to 0. So what we're left with for uh, C2 is x of t, y of t is equal to negative 3 times negative 1, 1, e to the 2t, and since we're looking for y of t, y of t will be negative 3 e to the 2t, and uh, we're, we're finding that at 1, so negative 3 e to the 2, 20 is d, and we are uh, done. It's funny how this was uh, only 20 questions, and yet uh, it actually felt like one of the, the harder ones near the end there, and I, I took I think I took more time on this one than I did on all the other ones, so that's, that's a little odd, but uh, okay, see ya.